from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Ahead today, K-State's Robin Reed talking about the circumstances that might lead you crop producers to make last-minute changes to your ARC PLC selection for your 2021 crops. She'll go over some key things to think about there. Also, K-State's Greg Ibendahl returns this time covering his brand new analysis of Kansas grain farm expense trends, which Greg says are a good indicator of where you producers should concentrate your cost management. And on this week's horticulture segment, K-State's Anthony Reardon on some basic principles of home landscaping that he'll be talking up during a K-State Garden Hour webinar next week. All this and more right here on Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. Putting distance between yourself and others is critical to slowing the spread of coronavirus. So here are ways to stay in contact without the physical contact part. Call, send a text, set up a video conference, post on social media, dedicate a song on the radio. If you have symptoms of fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going to their office. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. You're listening to Agriculture Today. We're glad to have you aboard once more. And this first segment for you crop producers, as we have this key deadline coming up for a variety of reasons, March the 15th, one of which that is the final day to enroll your 2021 crop production under the Farm Safety Net Programs, ARC and PLC for short. Many of you have done this already. But there may be cause for revisiting that decision at the 11th hour. We'll pick up on that right now with Robin Reed, farm economist for K-State Research and Extension, and constantly works the numbers and updates them on the ARC and PLC choice. So, Robin, we have a fair percentage of producers already committed to either ARC or PLC, do we not? Yes, and I've heard different numbers across our state and the nation, but we're definitely approaching the end as far as the deadline's March 15th, but our FSA offices need time to process these elections. And so if you have not made your decision yet, I would say at this point, there's no reason to wait. You know, we are not in the marketing year that we're making this decision on. So price information is not going to be forthcoming. That's helpful in this decision. We don't have this crop in the ground yet other than our winter wheat, which we're going to discuss today. So we don't have a whole lot of information on the yield side. So it is really time to make this decision if you have not. And to clarify As we do, as we talk about ARC and PLC payments, we are discussing decisions that will result in payments in the fall of 2022 regarding the production of 21. Correct. So just so everybody's clear on this, you're getting paid for the crop that you harvest this year, but the marketing year for that harvested crop is an entire year before they determine that price and calculate the payment. So for our fall crops, that marketing year starts September 1st and will run through August 31st of 2022. And then your payment would be in October of that year. For our wheat, our marketing year that we're making this decision on will start June 1st of this year and run through May 31st of next year. You and your associates here of K-State have been putting together guiding tools, if you will, to help producers come to a conclusion on ARC or PLC. You arrived at some trends potentially for which of the programs would be more advantageous for which crops. So that's what producers have to lean on right now. Yeah, and I would like to emphasize this is really an individual farm decision. So the PLC program is going to use your established yield on the farm. So if there is a PLC payment triggered, the higher your established yield, the faster those payments grow. And then in the ARC County program, that's a county level yield that sets the benchmark and the actual revenue for the year. So each farm is going to be subject to their county guarantee and for the PLC program, their own program yield. So I'm going to talk in general terms, but to look specific at your own economics, we do have a spreadsheet on our website, agmanager.info, 
that we call the trade-off spreadsheet. So I'll refer people to that. But just in general terms, I've been talking to a lot of producers across the state and across the nation even in the last couple months. And this is really how I'd summarize this decision. The easiest one would be soybean base. We have never seen a PLC payment in soybeans. They have always leaned towards the ARC County program. Price has to get below 840 to trigger a payment. I definitely see that continuing into the future that this commodity would be better in the ARC County program where there's a chance of a payment if the county yield is less than the guarantee. So that one I can kind of say with certain. As we get to the other commodities, it gets more difficult. Wheat makes up about half of our base here in Kansas, even if corn and soybeans are grown on a lot of that base acres these days. Wheat has to get below 550 to trigger a PLC payment, which it has done and done in a big way the last five years. But right now, the prices that we're seeing could be well above this. And again, that marketing year doesn't start till June 1st. So if we think wheat's going to stay above 550 for the next marketing year, it would be logical to put that base in Arc County. Now, um, as we discussed, this also would lean towards Arc County if there are yield concerns, because this is the one crop that is in the ground now, and we have a little shade of an idea of there's going to be yield issues. Mm-hmm. I know we've talked about the freeze um, possibly impacting some areas of the state, persisting dry conditions. In fact, more areas of the state could be affected by this. And so if this is believed to be a county level yield issue, that would lend the producer to look at our county for their wheat base more closely. And that's the nature of the questions you're getting from some producers now that are concerned about the state of those wheat stands? Yeah. So what I try to talk a producer through when they're looking at wheat is, are you worried about the price side, you know, getting below 550 in the next marketing year? Do you want that price protection? And I can easily say to a producer, that's the way to go. And if we don't hit 550, that's a good thing. You can sell your wheat for a good price and not worry about this payment. But there is a situation if we have those dry conditions, if we don't get a good crop this year and price remains high, Arc County will definitely be the program to be in. So that's something that a producer has to just weigh the risks at their own county level and think about what might be best. At the end of the day, we hope we don't get payments out of either program. You know, we get a good yield and a good price. But the producer just needs to think about, do I want the price side protection or do I want that yield component? And the disadvantage of taking Art County is just that the payment caps out quite quickly. So it's a shallow loss program. It only pays to a certain amount. And then your payment is capped. We haven't mentioned corn yet. And we probably should plug something in about the prevailing thinking on the option of choice there, Robin. Yeah, so corn is another one that I can agree with a producer that either program is not a bad choice. And I say that for the same reason I was talking with the wheat. Corn has to get below 370 in the next marking year to trigger a payment. And that marking year average takes each month's price weighted by the amount of grain sold. So if we have higher prices even next fall, there's a likelihood we won't get a PLC payment. But if you're worried about returning to prices that we saw just in 2020, 2020 was a lesson in price volatility. Mm -hmm. And we know this market can move quite quickly. So for downside price protection, PLC is the program to choose. Now, I've also talked to a lot of producers who are concerned about the La Nina and dry conditions that we could possibly have this summer. If that is the concern, then I would stick with Art County because that'll provide a payment if the county level yield suffers a significant loss. And in that case, likely our PLC, our price would be high enough a PLC payment would not kick in. And is grain sorghum in the same bucket as corn in that respect then? Most generally, yes. So grain sorghum, another interesting one, I six months ago, I would have said, you know, this is not even something to think about. Put it in PLC. It's always had good payments in PLC. But just the premium that it's ran 
here in the last six months, last few months especially, it's looking like the chance of anything less than 395 would be unlikely with the current conditions. Now, all we need is a lot more grain sorghum to be produced in our state and across the nation and or China to reduce their export buying of grain sorghum. And pretty soon we're back to less than 395. So again, same thought. If you're worried about the price side, put it in PLC. If you're worried about dry conditions, which grain sorghum is a little more drought hardy than our corn, but still if, if there's dry condition yield loss concern and you don't think price will get less than 395, then Arc County is the way to go. Well, Robin, if a producer is reconsidering or thinking about reconsidering their prior commitment to either ARC or PLC based on some of the factors you cited. They do have time, but that time is extremely short. They need to make a call one way or the other relatively quickly, right? Yes, they definitely need to make that call sooner than later. And a couple other things I just want to stress. This Mm -hmm. is only a one-year decision, so don't beat yourself up about it. You get to do this whole thing again next year. And also, you do have the flexibility. Most of our producers have multiple FSA farm numbers. So if you really can't decide, I would say um, for corn, for example, put some of your farm, your FSA farm numbers in PLC and some of your FSA farm numbers in Arc County and just split split the program. Spread and, the risk then. Yeah, exactly. And basically, just look at what farms have the largest Uh, program yield. And those would be the ones that would lean better towards PLC. So I've seen producers do that, hedge their bets with both programs, and that's not a bad strategy either. We would leave producers with this. Do utilize as well those excellent tools at agmanager.info that Robin and colleagues have put together on this ARC PLC election decision. Robin, as always, we appreciate the comments and the input. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Eric. She's Robin Reed, farm economist, K-State Research and Extension. This is Agriculture Today. We'll return shortly on the K-State Radio Network. For information on threatening weather, you should depend on the National Weather Service and their broadcast on NOAA Weather Radio. NOAA Weather Radio is an all-hazards radio network that provides up-to-the-minute weather information, including life-saving warnings anytime, day or night. NOAA Weather Radio also broadcasts information on man-made disasters, such as chemical spills, amber alerts, or other national emergencies. For the National Weather Service, I'm Bill Curtis. We're back now on this Agriculture Today, and our guest, again, has been hard at it, working up all sort of analytical numbers for you producers to consider over the last several weeks. And we've invited him back by for a look at yet one more effort in the area of farm management. Greg Ibendahl is a farm management economist with K-State Research and Extension. Greg has just posted the finishing results of his work analyzing farm expenses here in Kansas over multiple decades time. Something that really hasn't been dug into very deeply in this way, has it, Greg? No, I don't think so. So we basically have a lot of uh, farm records going back to 1977, and we have them all really good at the whole farm level. So we can, you know, we can produce balance sheets and income statements pretty easily. So, you know, within an income statement, there's a whole bunch of different categories. So I thought it'd be interesting, at least as an initial start, to go through and take those expenses and just to see where farmers are spending their money, because... You know, operating a farm business is certainly no cheap uh, operation. I think last year in our KFMA records, uh, our total average farm expenses was almost $600,000 per farm. So, you know, that, that's quite a bit of money farmers are spending every year. I think it would be to farmers' benefits to really understand where all that money is going every year. And the breakout is what we'll look at here. Again, using Kansas Farm Management Association records and to be specific for grain farms now exclusively, right? Yeah, so I mean, there's there's the same expense categories for both livestock and uh, grain farms, both. But if I started including the uh, livestock farms in there, I'd, I'd have a lot more expense dollars and categories that really wouldn't be all that important to a lot of grain producers. So just to help minimize the amount of categories I, I have, and I think I kind of focused on maybe about eight or so major categories. That I, it was a lot easier to do that on, on a grain farm basis than trying to go ahead and you know pull things like feed and stuff like that in for the livestock farms as well. 
Well, let's talk directly then about the categories you identified here. What were those? Well, again, these are some of the major, major categories I use. If you look at our Ag Manager website and go to our KFMA info and look at the whole farm analysis, you'll see all the other categories are out there. But the main ones are, are machinery, fertilizer, seed, herbicides, interest costs, labor, crop insurance, and cash rent. And then I have another, which is really just the remainder of, of everything else when you take off all those other categories and subtract them from total farm expenses. Well, the details are what are intriguing here. So let's walk through those, starting with the machinery expenses that are incurred on Kansas farms have been since 1977 to 2019. That was the stretch of time you looked at here. Machinery in and of itself does separate out into subcategories. Yeah, so the machinery itself in the main table, that's a kind of a catch-all category for all the machinery expenses. So that would include things like normal depreciation, fuel, repair and maintenance, uh, custom har- uh, rates, that, that kind of stuff. And I should point out, too, when we, when we measure depreciation on our KFMA farms, we do it a little differently than you would on your typical tax depreciation. So we use the concept of economic depreciation when we figure out net farm income from our KFMA farms. And that's really an attempt by us to match the actual decline in asset value to what farmers are actually seeing. So we don't, we don't have the uh, accelerated depreciation like you would use in tax accounting. We kind of ma- We kind of slow that down. Down. So hopefully the, the asset values you see on our KFMA farms, those tend to match out the actual asset values that you actually see on your own particular farm. Then as you looked at those subcategories that fall under the machinery heading here, what jumped out to you as far as expense trends? Was there any one thing or a set of things? Well, I, I guess the first overall thing I'd like to say is if you look at our machinery as a total percent of crop expenses, it ranges from about 40 percent down to about currently 30 percent. So it's it's by far and away our biggest category. I was really surprised so that that didn't change more than what it did because this includes the era of kind of switching over to no-till stuff and, and doing fewer farm operations. So I, I really expected the uh, percent of crop expenses to be even higher in, in 1977, late 70s, as we made that transition over because we, you know, we do make fewer field trips now. But as my counterpart in the KFMA program, Kevin Herbo, mentioned to me, too, he says, well, you know, part of that transition, too, is you, you, to do no-till effectively, you're probably buying better equipment that's able to place seed more effectively and, and maybe even buying your own sprayer where you didn't have one before. So he wasn't really all that surprised that we see that percent from machine stay pretty high all the way across our time frame. So once again, from 40% in 1977 down to 30% as of the 2019 data, but depreciation, fuel, repairs, interest charges, have those independently changed much? Oh, they kind of go up and down a little bit. I think you, you probably see a little bit of uh, farmers buying more machinery when they have like, some really good years. Like if you look at the you know that 2012 period where we do have some pretty good net farm income, you do see that depreciation number bump up there for a couple years, which to me is an indication that farmers did buy more machinery in, in those high net farm income years in an effort to lower their net farm income. Well, and doing that, that's, that's certainly an okay thing to do. Uh, you would expect, though, as uh, you buy more newer machinery, that should increase your depreciation amount. But then it also should be counterbalanced by having lower repairs. And we do see some of that kind of inverse relationship happen, that when we have higher depreciation, which is both a function of having more equipment and also having newer equipment, that when that tends to bump up, we do see repairs and maintenance tend to go the other direction. So that is kind of being borne out by our data. Well, counterbalancing the fall off in expenses for machinery was an increase in other categories, including seed and herbicide expense, and that goes hand in glove with this shift to more no-till systems, you say? Yeah, I, I would think so. So, you know, we've, we've, we've kind of d- done a dramatic switch in how we farm here in Kansas, and really across the U.S. we've gone from a lot of, you know, mechanical weed control now to doing uh, more no-till and doing more herbicide control of weeds. But really, you think about it, though, really your, your seeds and your herbicides are almost tied together. They're really a kind of a system. And we have seeds designed specifically for the use of certain herbicides and such. So, you know, as we put a lot more technology into those products, our seeds and our herbicides, it's not surprising to me that those two categories have increased over time. And if you look at kind of our historical data, really those numbers have, uh, in some cases, more than doubled over that 42-year time frame. From 6%, you say, back in 77 to 13% of overall expenses. Yeah, so it's certainly a much bigger deal than what it used to be. And want to acknowledge the interest rate trends as well, peaks and valleys over that 42-year time horizon. 
Yeah, so normally you know, when we look at the main farm financial ratios, you know, there's a separate one just to account for the interest expense when they did the original kind of sweet 16 farm financial ratios. That's because that is a very important category. If you're paying, and the rule of thumb there is if you're paying more than 10% interest cost on all your expenses, that's really more than most farms can handle. That means you got too much debt. Well, you know, in the last 10, 20 years, or at least certainly in 10 or 15 years, interest has become a really kind of a minor player in the overall expense side of things. And that's really because of the interest rate. You know, we've got kind of, you know, interest rates are kind of about as low as they ever have been. And as such, the interest expense amount is really pretty low. It's like, I think, about 4 or 5%. But if you contrast that back in the you know early 80s, late 70s, when we did have double-digit interest expense, that was when the interest was really a big deal. And at that point in time, the interest expense was about 15% of total farm expenses. So you can just think of the situation that would happen if suddenly, and I don't know if it's going to happen or not, but it could very easily could, I think, with the amount of money we're pumping into the economy, that we do start to see some inflation and start raising interest rates. Then I think you're going to see a lot of farmers in the world are hurt because, you know, right now well, it's only 5%, but if it would jump back up to 15%, you know, that's, that's going to be a significant increase in expenses for most farms, potentially. We'd advise producers, by the way, to have a look at your article on this topic that gets into some tables that illustrate this further year by year by year for each of the categories. It's at agmanager.info. What do you think the takeaway can be from this work? And you're, you're continuing to toil away at it, by the way. What do you think it suggests about farm expenses, which we know are a significant function of net farm income in Kansas? Well, I, I think, the, again, this is just an initial take on this whole thing. I, I, one of my colleagues, Terry Griffin, and I are going to look at some of these other issues related to this, especially on the machinery side. But to me, I think farmers really need to pay attention where their money is going. I mean, there are certain things you really, it's kind of hard to control, so you're going to need to buy fertilizer, and you can do some things there about maybe when you buy it, when the crop mix you grow. But things like fuel, I mean, you're going to need to operate fuel for your tractors, so you can't do a whole lot of things there. I would say the one thing that farmers do have a lot of control over, though, is, the, is how much machinery they buy and the amount that they do have on their farm. And, again, that's our biggest expense category. So I think I would spend a lot of time there focusing on, you know, making sure I actually need to buy this. Am I actually going to cover the fixed cost on that? Because, you know, there's a lot more to owning a machinery than just the fuel and repairs that go into it. When you figure the cost of buying that machine, the depreciation, the interest charge that goes into buying that, that's a pretty significant uh, expense for farmers. And I think farmers need to keep an eye on that going forward. And as producers would make changes or consider alterations in their their cropping practices. This is something that has to be kept at the forefront. That's rather intuitive. But. Yeah, I, yeah, I would certainly think so. Well, with the amount that they're spending, and you, you certainly can make changes to how you buy your machinery. Right now, farmers are buying a lot of their machinery with the idea they're going to minimize taxes, so you, but you're buying more machinery during the good years and less during bad years, and that's a pretty good way to even out cash flow, but it may not be the lowest cost way to own that machinery either. So think about that in addition to the cash flow side of things when you buy machinery. Well, there have been interesting shifts in these expenses over those 42 years that you studied here, Greg, and it's a rather instructive analysis you put together. We hope producers will have a look at it at agmanager.info, entitled A Percentage Breakdown of Farm Expenses by Category, using Kansas Farm Management Association records, 1977 through 2019. And looking forward to your deeper dive into those machinery expenses in particular as you analyze these numbers further. Greg, we'll talk about that at that time. Thank you. All right, thanks. Greg Ivendahl, Farm Management Economist with K-State Research and Extension. And we'll be back in a few moments with more for you here on Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. Broadcasting from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And next up, today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. Well, the former lead agricultural trade negotiator at the U.S. Office of Trade Representative Greg Dowd told a Farm Foundation forum this week that market access in the China trade agreement was critical 
He stressed implementation of nearly all the 57 market access commitments, placing emphasis on the approval of more U.S. facilities to export to China. He said before the U.S. started the Phase 1 negotiations, the U.S. had about 1,500 facilities eligible to export agricultural products to China. That would have been beef processing facilities, dairy, pet food facilities, and so on. Today, he says, we now have well over 4,000 facilities in the U.S. eligible to export their products to China, giving the U.S. access to the Chinese market like never before. Dowd went on to say the improvements in market access that we now have in place are going to, in his words, treat us well going forward. As for the purchase commitments, Dowd simply said it comes down to U.S. competitiveness, a point focused on by Chinese negotiators. He also noted the two sides spent a considerable amount of time talking about ethanol, with trade in the corn-based fuel something that Dowd said he believed China was truly interested in. He says his sense is that China really is trying to think through the whole notion of infrastructure for the use of ethanol. As for overall market conditions moving ahead, Dowd predicted continued volatility, notably with China involved in the market. He says there's no way to say with certainty that in two or three years whether China would be importing 30 million metric tons of corn or just 5 million metric tons. A coalition of 35 agriculture groups is urging Congress now to work with the Small Business Administration to ensure farm partnerships and limited liability corporations have the same access to the Paycheck Protection Program that's granted to sole proprietors. This letter, which was signed by all major commodity and farm organizations, as well as the Farm Credit Council, cooperatives, banks, other agribusinesses, argues that excluding farm partnerships and LLCs produces disparate results based solely on farm structure and not need and misinterprets Congress' intent. When Congress updated the PPP, it created a special provision for calculating farmers and ranchers' eligibility, allowing them to use gross income instead of net income in those calculations. In the months since Congress passed the Economic Aid Act, however, the SBA has interpreted this language to exclude farm and ranch operations, which are structured as partnerships and LLCs, the letter states. They said that they believe this interpretation is an error and uh, preventing many farm and ranch families from participating in the program. Now, several congressional leaders agree with this. Five lawmakers wrote a letter to the leadership at the SBA and the Treasury Department saying they anticipated that the SBA would apply the same broad interpretation of sole proprietorship, independent contractor, or self-employed individual that the SBA applied in the first round of PPP to its new rules for farmers. By excluding partnerships from the gross income calculation, they say farmers and ranchers that run their businesses through a partnership of LLC are limited to payroll costs that they pay to non-owner employees unless they have met net income from operations. With time running short to apply for that program, the deadline is March the 31st. The coalition is urging Congress to include a clarification in the next stimulus bill. And new U.S. Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack is facing a request from his home state congressional delegation asking to expand COVID-19 relief aid to custom cattle feeders. The Iowa congressional delegation, five Republicans and one Democrat, wrote Vilsack yesterday highlighting the the exclusion, that is, of custom cattle feeders in the coronavirus food aid program. USDA continues to conduct a review of CFAP. The department froze some parts of the C. CFAP payments, dubbed CFAP Additional Assistance, or CFAP AA as they call it, back in January. The USDA continues taking applications for the program through tomorrow. So far, it's unclear whether CFAP AA payments will be released. The Iowa delegation highlighted that former USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue had expanded producers eligible under CFAP but had left out custom cattle feeders. The Iowa delegation stated in its letter that the USDA had set precedent for eligibility by allowing contract growers raising swine and poultry to be eligible for aid by demonstrating a drop in income from 2019 to 2020. Those contract poultry and swine producers also must prove they are not entitled to the share of sale proceeds for the livestock and poultry. Custom cattle feeders could easily meet both of those eligibility requirements, according to these Iowa lawmakers in their letter to Vilsack. 
This week, the USDA is making the first step in a month-long process of finding out the planting intentions of the nation's producers. The USDA's Gary Crawford talks more about that. As we speak, the Agriculture Department's mailing out some special survey forms to selected producers. We're going to have nearly 80,000 producers that we reach out to. Those forms will ask those farmers how much of what crops they intend to plant this spring. Lance Honig with USDA Statistics Service says the results will be in USDA's upcoming prospective plantings report. Now, of course, last week at the USDA's Outlook Forum, many analysts and economists were tossing out all kinds of educated guesses at what farmers are likely to plant. Obviously, you can look at things like economics and what might make the most sense, but that doesn't necessarily tell you what farmers are actually intending to do. And of course, to find that out, there's really no other source you can go to other than the producers themselves. So that's what USDA is doing. The survey forms should be in farmers' mailboxes here in a couple of days. The data from those will be the basis of USDA's prospective planning to report coming out the end of March. One of the most highly anticipated USDA reports of the year, right, Lance? I think that's probably safe to say. I think it is Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And this morning, the International Grains Council raised its forecasts for global grain production in the 2021 year, thanks to stronger-than-expected wheat crops in Australia and the Black Sea region. The intergovernmental body said in its monthly grains market report that it now expects grain harvest to total 2.21 billion metric tons, 6 million tons more than it had last forecast. Larger than previously forecast, wheat harvests in Australia, Russia, and and Kazakhstan driving that revision, while soybean and corn harvests were also revised slightly higher. Wheat harvests now expected to yield 773 million tons, up from the January forecast. Soybean harvests, 360 million tons, and corn forecasts at 1.13 million tons. That was 1 million tons higher than last month's forecast, meaning it, the IGC expects the 2021 season to produce a record amount of grain, 31 million tons more than in the previous season. That's a glance at today's agricultural headlines. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus, so stay a minimum of six feet away from others and stay home if you can. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Agriculture Today continues now with our weekly horticulture segment, And focusing once again on a series that's been launched by the K-State Department of Horticulture. And uh, for you homeowners and gardeners, it's a great opportunity to bone up on a number of things regarding lawn care, garden care, landscaping, and it's to the latter we'll speak of today. What we're talking about, though, is this series of K-State Garden Hours taking place over the noon hour every other Wednesday The next one will take place this coming Wednesday, March the 3rd. And hosting it is our guest now. He is the Research and Extension Horticulture Agent for the West Plains Extension District. That's Finney and Scott Counties in western Kansas. Anthony Reardon is with us. And Anthony, you will be discussing best plans for a beginner's landscape during that garden hour this coming Wednesday. Tell us more about this series, though. It's intended to allow folks to get some great information on a variety of things. Yeah, it is. So thanks for having me, Eric. You know, it's a free gardening webinar series. Uh, It's hosted by K-State Research and Extension, and it's intended to help really just gardeners across the state improve their gardening success. So that can be gardeners from really any level. We've had people that are experts tuning in, but also you know, our master gardeners, even people that are just starting out. Obviously, my topic, (laughs) Plants for the Beginners Landscape, is more so intended towards the uh, beginning gardener. So we're trying to teach people sort of the best methods that they can manage their landscapes. We will tell folks how to take part in any or all of these garden hours as we wrap up here today. But you will be, again, concentrating on the beginner's landscape. That is to say, what folks need to be thinking about if they really haven't done much in the way of landscape improvement via plant selection or design or what have you. What are some of the focal points you're hoping to share with folks during this session this coming Wednesday, Anthony? Yes, you know, there's really two main factors I'm going to be delving into. Um, environmental factors are obviously something that's very prevalent in Kansas that you have to uh, sort of look out for. Wind is a huge factor in western Kansas. 
Um, our soil composition is very uh, high, highly alkaline. So that means the pH is really something you have to take into account with the plants that you're choosing. And then water, I mean, obviously, <laughs> we don't get rain too often, especially in the western half. And even, you know, nutrients is another factor. So really everything that you need to know the basics of when choosing plants, we're going to delve into a little bit. And then we're going to go into sort of the hardy plants that survive in Kansas. You know, there's a lot of old plants that have been around forever, like Van Hoot Spirea, for example. It's this huge shrub. It's got arching branches. It's covered in white flowers in the spring. It's been around since Victorian times, but there's a reason it's been around since Victorian <laughs> times. People really enjoy those beautiful flowers, and it's incredibly low maintenance. Really, as long as it's getting water, you don't have to pay attention to it whatsoever unless it's starting to get too big and uh, starting to grow in uh, places where it's not supposed to be. Really, that's kind of just what we're delving into with each of these shrubs. It's just uh, low-maintenance plants that you don't have to pay much attention to, and it's not that hard to keep them alive. No matter where folks are in the state and no matter what their environmental conditions, they do need to study the performance, the background, and the adaptability of whatever ornamental plant material they're looking at, right? Yeah, so you definitely want to look into sort of the uh, the backgrounds of the plants. Eastern Kansas is very different from Western Kansas. There's a lot of plants that will survive in Eastern Kansas that won't survive in Western Kansas, and that's simply because of water requirements. Runs the gamut as far as what plays into the health of the plants. But that's something your local extension agent can obviously help you out with. And also, local garden centers are very knowledgeable, and that's they're trying to sell you a product, and they want you to be a returning customer, so they're going to want you to be successful with your plants. Well, plant adaptability is a key, clearly. What about, though, mixing and matching, and that is to say assembling a landscape where the plants complement each other? Uh, one uses one's imagination to a certain extent here, but are there some guidelines that folks can go by there, Anthony? Yeah, so you definitely want to pay attention to sort of the size of your plants, obviously. Aim for like a mid-sized shrub, and then you want maybe some taller shrubs or even trees in there, and then you want your sort of low-growing shrubs to ground covers also. So different heights, different areas to look when you're creating a landscape. And then obviously, you probably want to go with a color scheme. They say there's cool colors and hot colors, Mm -hmm. Um, and those would be your reds and yellows and oranges for the hot colors and cool colors. You'd be looking at your pinks and purples and whites and you kind of just want to match them to each other because you don't want your colors to clash. And then, you know, mix up your textures also. Different foliages obviously have different types of leaves, and there's grasses that have completely different leaves from, say, tulips or from, uh, you know, your annuals. So having different things to look at uh, definitely makes a garden interesting and keeps it from all being the same. As you said, there are loads of resources that folks can turn to for their landscaping plans, for ideas on plant selection that'll work for their setting. But you'd like folks to be aboard for this upcoming webinar, this K-State Garden Hour, and there will be an opportunity for questions and answers during that time. Will there not be? Yeah, so the webinar itself, or the presentation during the webinar, is about 45 minutes, and then we try to leave about 15 minutes for a Q&A at the end. And if we can't get to your question, we do try to reach out to you at least and get you an answer. There's a whole bunch of other horticulture agents working in the background during these things that can answer them if I am not able to also. So that's definitely something that we're able to accommodate. It's a great outlet. And how do folks take part? Where do they go to find out more or to link into this? So you'd have to register online. You go to ksre-learn.com backslash K-State Garden Hour. Um, It's a one-time registration, and then you will be registered for all of them. So you'll get a notification uh, when they are going live, and then you'll be uh, sent the recordings afterwards as well. Our spring series is going until April right now, and then I think we've got more series coming down the line that have yet to be announced. And it's a free program for anybody who wants to take part. Yep, completely free. It's as easy as searching for K-State Garden Hour. It is an excellent series taking place over the noon hours as it's set up currently every other Wednesday. And once more, the next session will focus on best plans for a beginner's landscape this coming Wednesday, March the 3rd. Take it in. 
Best of luck with it, Anthony. Thanks for giving us a brief preview right here. We'll talk again soon. Thank you. Anthony Reardon with us. He is the Research and Extension Horticulture Agent for the West Plains Extension District, Finney and Scott Counties in western Kansas. That's our horticulture segment for this week and our time for today. Thanks for tuning in. Eric Atkinson here for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.